what I'm going to talk here, so I'm going to change the gear a little bit. And the, so what do we do in the lab? Try to answer one question, sort of. Why the vows are so lethal? I hope for my talk, I'm going to give some idea the immune response. It's just one aspect of the disease, OK? But from our research, we try to answer why the rabies virus is so lethal. You know, we already talked about the previous speakers. Almost 100% lethal. So th that's, with that, I will come to move this, if it does. I guess there's no need for more introduction. But just mentioning definitely the rabies is a, one of the oldest diseases, or zoonotic diseases, almost four to 5,000 years history. And it unfortunately, it's still with us today, and it presents public health and economical problems. Uh, more than 50,000 people die of rabies each year. That one. That one, OK. And the, again, it's almost lethal, so 100%. Now, with the rabies pathogenesis, why is it so lethal? From the time of pastoral, there were a lot of research directed to this question. We have learned a lot. But what we learned is, the virus you know, through at the side of the bite, enter into the muscles with or without replication at this side. And then, but the most importantly, is the virus doesn't matter where you inject them. They will find the nerve fibers. It's from the nerves where they get into the nerve system and then tr may replicate at the dorsal root ganglia. And then it goes through the spinal cord into the brain. It is the virus in the replicate in the brain that causes the disease, the rabies. Uh, so, but after the virus replicate in the brain, eventually the virus will find it also again the nervous system, coming back to, to the periphery. If without it coming back, rabies will be dead because it cannot transmit to the next animals. So the problems they have to come back again, come back still through the nerve system. Mostly we know from the salivary gland when animals are, animals are biting a human or another animals. That's how the virus is transmitted. That's actually we know. But the other things, actually, we do not know. For example, how the virus, you know, once the virus in the brain, when they replicate it there, what it does to the host? You know, what it does, you know, when it's inside of, inside of the brain? And also how the host responds. Okay, we now know we, we respond to, to infection, whatever that it is. Of course, the ultimate question, why is this so lethal? Doesn't mean we solve the problem yet, but I think we push it one step closer. So why I talk about why you know, we understand so little. Rabies has been lethal as we know. But the problems at the time of death, it doesn't matter humans or animals, the pathology is very minimal. You, you think about necrosis, you think about apoptosis, you think about inflammation, you think about neuronal losses, they're all very minimal. What is trying to say is all these observations cannot explain the lethality of the disease. Uh, in actually, in humans, they were reported that more than 80% of the human patients, they do not develop neutralizing antibodies at the time of death. Now, we just uh, you know, had to talk about the neutralizing antibodies. It's a marker for immunization for protection, but actually, it's very important. Without neutralizing antibodies, Humans will, more people will die of rabies. Simply said that. So what we have been doing, so I'm going to talk about a lot more what we have been doing in the lab for the past, say, 10 years. What we have been doing is really looking at the host, how the host responds to rabies infection. Right? Why they cannot control the disease. Basically, why, again, explaining the problem, why the disease is so lethal. What we did, go back, please. Um, we did look at the, the, the host gene expression. Of course, anything comes in us, we have got to respond, right? That's how, how the balance of the gene. Either we get rid, rid of the pathogen, or the pathogen kills us. It's, it's, you know, this, that's how it goes. Uh, so we want to look at the host response using microarrays. And we also look at the histopathology and the immunohistochemistry to look at infiltration of inflammatory cells. Inflammation in the brain. It's not good. But without inflammation, it's even worse. And then we look at the blood brain barrier. Why I bring the blood brain barrier story into the talk is uh, rabies is very, 
peculiar infection. I already said, mentioned it earlier, it doesn't go anywhere if infect, it goes to the nerve system. One of the ways it goes to the nerve system is hiding from the immune system. When it goes to the nerve system, the immune system cannot recongolize it, so it cannot develop immunity, cannot fight with it. But, so in order to actually prevent, or in, in the future of course, to, to treat particular for patients with rabies, you may have to enhance the blood-brain barrier to allow the immune system effectors like an antibody to go to the brain to fight with it, fight with the virus. And of course, without this all, we can see this part of the innate immunity. Of course, most important is still the adaptive immune response. It's still the virus neutralizing antibodies. Again, I still want to emphasize, that's the most important immune effector. That will kill the virus, will control the virus. So with that, I'll go a little bit. So when we did the microarray analysis, I will not go into details, but one thing caught us eye is they re-upregulated the genes that is really important in the immune antiviral system. Now in this year, we actually use two viruses. One's a wild type, the silver head battery rabies virus, and uh, the previous speakers has mentioned quite a bit. And also we have laboratory adaptive viruses. Why don't we compare the two viruses? It does not matter we use intracerebral direct injection or inject infected animals by intramuscular route. What we found is the, the lab adaptive viruses induced a lot more of the immune genes compared to the wild type of virus. So we spent a lot of time to actually emphasize, concentrate on those uh, uh, areas. Why don't I simply said that there are two categories of genes the lab adapted valves induce in the, in, the, in the brain. One is the interferon system, one is the chemokine. So there are two major categories. Here we've shown the, 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 the interferon systems, not only the interferons, the interferon re related genes, effective genes. Here again we have shown the, 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 the lab adapted virus and in the wild type of virus, okay, either IC or AM. What we found very interestingly is that wild type of virus, they induce very little of the interferon system. But on the other hand, the lab adapted virus induce a lot. Okay, sometimes the, the, the increase is about 400 times, 400 fold increase in some of the genes. So that's interferon. So we move on is of course how the interferon works. The interferon is supposed to bind to their receptor and then upregulate many of the genes, but the important thing is the so-called STAT1 and STAT2. When these two dimerize, they go into the nucleus. In the nucleus, they promote transcription of many of the genes that are important for antivirus. Yes, we look at these genes, STAT1, STAT2, STAT3, in the brain that is by intracerebral infected, or intramuscular infected, or in the primary neurons. So what we see, see, is, see is the lab adapted viruses will induce a lot more expression of these genes compared to the wild type of virus. This is the control, if you use that as 100%, that's the ratio. The same, you know, in the, in the IC infected, the IM infected, and even in the primary neurons. It does really you know, show the consistency in that terms. And for the stats one and the two have to go into the nucleus to show the activity. So we show the here is, no doubt about it, the stats one. You can see here the, the one and the two in the control, in the, in the lab adapted infected neurons, you can see a lot more intranuclear localization. So that's the, the, the quanti uh, quantitation of the data. Now, so we talk about interferon. The next category is the chemokines. The chemokines, it's very similar sort of a picture. What we saw is in the animals infected with the lab adapted viruses, you see a lot more upregulation than infected with the wild type of virus. And this, of course, not only by the microarray, we did the RT-PCR to look at the gene expression, the same pattern. So the, we use the three chemokines, 
you can see they're highly upregulated. Again, the inner animals infected with the lab adapted virus, particularly D6. And we also measured the protein itself. Again, you can see here the protein, particularly D6 after infection, is the highest, the peak of expression of these chemokines. Now, what do the chemokines do? What this even does? Of course, after we reported uh, these findings and many others followed suits, definitely the, while the lab adapted viruses can induce very good innate immune responses, particularly the interference, interferon beta, as shown here. So what do the innate immunity do, does in the system? Definitely, like we're talking about, the interference, it has a direct antiviral functions, and the chemokines is attract inflammatory cells come into the brain. It's tell the body something's here, you know, the system you got to come to help us to control it. And uh, uh, because of these cells come into the CNS, they enhance the blood brain barrier. And, the, and the induction of the innate immunity can promote the adaptive immune responses. In rabies, is the virus neutralizing antibodies. So look at the, the, the animals infected with either lab adapted or wild type of viruses. You can see here that at the day six again is the lab adapted viruses induce a lot more infiltration of inflammatory cells. You can see here if it's by immunocytochemistry, again you see more infiltration of the cells from the periphery to the, to the CNS by the virus, by the lab adapted, not by the wild type of virus. Uh, again, there's simply a quantification of those findings. Now, okay, you said that the, the interference, the innate immune system can help infiltration, but we have another way to improve it. We stick the chemokines into a rabies virus. What we found indeed, they induce much more infiltration of the uh, inflammatory cells. For example, we use either Rantis, Epi-10, just two kind of chemokines. So these chemokines attract inflammatory cells coming to CNS. Part of these cells can help open up to the blood brain barrier. What I try to show, stick a little bit here, the, the blood brain barrier. The blood brain barrier basically is the barrier. What it normally does is try to prevent many of the molecules in the periphery, in the blood system, go into the brain because our brain is a very dedicated organ there. So normally how this is done is basically by a so-called endo, capital endothelial cells. They form a barrier. If you want to, because whatever, it's not a single cell go everywhere, the cells have to contact with another cell. So how the barrier it is, in, um, between the cells, there are many proteins sort of tightening it. So they will not allow the unwanted molecules to in the brain. But we, because the brain has to survive, they need a lot of things from the periphery, nutrients, oxygen. So they will allow the small molecules to go in, but it will prevent the larger ones. Many of them, the pathogens. So we, actually for this part, we did a very little in the beginning. Most of this is done by our colleagues at the Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson University. Uh, we definitely showed in animals, again, infected with wild lab adapted viruses, it induced a high up enhancement of the blood brain barrier. This is in life mice. In the, uh, and in the wild type of virus, on the other hand, induced very little change in the blood brain barrier during the process of infection. Uh, this just shows if, if we use increase 10 times more of the wild type of virus, we still do not show the increase or the enhancement of the blood and bear uh, in, uh, permeability. It's the, it's the lab adapted viruses that induces. Uh, actually, I won't go into detail. Uh, what do we mean hypothesizing how this happens? It's again the chemokines. One of the chemokines that we found here is IP10. They can induce the cells come in for infiltrating inflammatory T cells, and these cells can execute another, another cytokinal chemokine. This actually helps to enhance the blood brain barrier. On the other hand, they also induce the Th1 cells. When these cells come in, 
they produce more of the IP10, so of course it's the positive feedback or exacerbation of the problem. We talked about infiltration of cells, we talked about the blood brain barrier, and now we're talking about the adaptive immunity, which is the antibody response. Now I want to go into details again, is we look at, just look at here, this one is infected with, with wild type of virus, wild type of virus, wild type of virus, wild type of virus. Okay, you infect them, even though they, they, how many days after you measure the neutralizing antibodies, almost nothing. This is the mouse. But on the other hand, if you infect it with a lab adapted viruses, the lab adapted means you know many, you know you take the virus from the wild animals to humans, then you adapted them in the in the system in the laboratory. Could it be continuous passage in animals, or actually passage the virus in the cells? When you passage the virus, the, the, the virus change. They become so-called, uh, you know, adapted. In the rabies situation, we call them fixed virus. What the fixed mean is, um, the previous two, two speakers talked about, re, one of the peculiar situations for rabies is a long incubation period. Now he mentioned about eight years now. But most of them is three weeks to three months. But they're still very long compared to influenza, how many days, a couple of days, or many other diseases. It's a long incubation period. And it, the problem with long incubation period, and the, so when you adapt the viruses and you infect your lab animals, in the beginning it's still a variable, and it was after many, many passages. What happens, the virus, will in, the incubation period will be shortened. When the incubation period is shortened to a certain level, they can no longer be shortened. This is called a fixed. It's a fixed in incubation period. It's not fixed by four months or anything else. That's what we call a fixed virus in rabies, uh, uh, in a uh, peculiar situation. Now we're dealing with dogs. This is a dog infected with a Chinese wild type of virus. Now antibodies are very low compared to this. This is the CSF, this is the serum. Even at this, this is almost the, at the time of death of the dogs. Even here, it's very low antibodies. We, again, we, are, we, we just debated quite a bit. What is the risk protective antibody response, right? But I won't go into the details, but I mean, one, one, one to say is in dogs at the time of death, they are three or four weeks after infection. The antibody titer, at least the virus neutralizing antibody titer is very, very low. It definitely is below the 0.5 magic line, how that is determined, I guess we, again, is, but anyway, simply said, is in dogs in, infected with the wild type of virus, they do not develop antibodies. Not only, not in the CSF, but they do not have in the uh, serum either. There's another study we've done it here. Uh, 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 we use a, a NG11, it's a Nigeria virus. Again, it's a wild type. You can see here at the day seven, at the day 21, almost nothing. It doesn't matter from the serum or the CSF. On the other hand, the dogs infected with the lab adapted viruses, they develop higher levels of antibodies. Of course, those dogs will not die, will not develop disease. They protect, they have antibody. So therefore, antibodies are still very important in terms of protection. So we talked about so what's the end point, right? We have a virus from, from the wild, and we have the virus adapted into the laboratory. When we use mouse model to look at it, to, to compare the pathogenicity or, or variance in that terms, what we can see here is, if you use a, a lab adapted viruses, you go increase the dose, of course you're gonna kill the mice. But if you use a wild type of virus, you, you need a very little to kill 90% of the, the mouse, the mice. So you can see the variance difference almost a thousand times, simply you know, for that measurement. So, the ne so summarize this part of my talk, we can see here see, the lab adapted rabies viruses, they activate, they innate, and it adaptive immune responses. They, they by what, how they do it, they induce the expression of innate immune genes, particularly interference with chemokines, and then it attract inflammatory uh, cells coming to the brain, 
and the enhancement of the blood brain barrier permeability. They induce, in, uh, induce the innate immunity and promote, of course, the adaptive immune responses, the neutralizing antibodies. So therefore, the induction of the immune responses is one of the mechanisms how the lab adaptive loss attenuates. And this is this what we uh, saw. Now, in the wild type, or the street viruses, they evade, they try not to touch the system, the immune system. You know, I said earlier, because one way they do it is that they do not not replicate outside of the nerve system. Because the nerve system, in a way, is immunologically privileged site. So they cannot be recognized by the immune system. So that's one way they do it. Another way we can talk about a little bit later. So they do not induce many of the innate immune genes. They do not attract a lot of inflammatory cells. Okay, the, the BBB is not really enhanced until the very end of the disease. Almost we see it's too little too late for rabies. And this is of no little to non-adaptive immune responses. And therefore the virus, they can replicate. They can transmit, they can spread in the system. It causes the disease. So that's, and this is what we are all understanding for the time being. And follow that, we ask the question, why? Why the wild type of virus cannot stimulate the immune responses? So what we have done is rabies, actually, we talk about sunethal, but the virus is very simple comparatively. It's the only half of, it can translate five structured proteins. Very simple. So what we did is just switch one of them, the glycoprotein. The reason the glycoprotein, because it's on the, the surface of the, of the virion, they bind into the receptors, so therefore go into the nerve system. It's also the only protein that will stimulate for the production of neutralizing antibodies. So therefore, we are, with the beginning, we changed just the glycoprotein. Simply said, if we use the lab adapted virus, switch the, or replace the glycoprotein from a wild type of virus, the virus would be almost like wild type of virus. So what I can show here, this is virus growth in the, in the cell culture. You can see here the wild type. You see the, re, the, the, the recombinant express the wild type. You can see here and here, they, they cannot grow very well anymore in the lung neuronal cells. And also you can see here, they do not induce the, the, the expression of the innate immune genes. You know, I, again, you see the chemokines. Is once you change, this is it's a lab adapted virus, okay, wild type. Okay, it does induce. But when you switch that, change it to a, a G protein from the wild type of virus. It doesn't matter from a dog virus or from a bat virus. The induction suddenly dropped down. And the, uh, this is the same for infiltri inf infiltration of inflam inflammatory cells or the BBB permeability change. It end up, it's a wild type of virus now. It's a virulent virus. Just switch one protein. That's how, how the virus control the virulence. So therefore, we can say the rabies virus glycoprotein is associated at least with the activation or evasion of the immune responses. You only need to replace the G protein. Then you change the phenotype of the virus. Then the question is why? How, how this one protein would change, it, change the whole who are virulence of the virus. And very early on, in the, in, again, Jefferson, in our own lab, what we have shown is the pathogenicity of the, of the virus is actually inversely correlated with the expression of the virus glycoprotein. Now here we show is the lab adapted viruses, CVS24, it's the virulent in the mouse. And then the bat virus, what you can see here, we use two proteins, one is the nuclear protein, one is the glycoprotein. When you see here the anti-nuclear protein, the expression, the difference is not that much. But however, on the glycoprotein, it's a huge difference. It's almost no expression in the wild type of virus infected animals compared to the animals infected with the lab adapted virus. And this could further be done in, in again in the system with a laboratory adapted any wild type of virus, what well, you can see here, the nuclear protein expression is very similar, but the G protein level of expression, almost a daily light difference. You see a little bit, but very, very little. We use another method to, to confirm is this Western blot. Again, we can see here, this is a wild type of virus, lab adapted, this is intracerebral infected, intramuscular infected, in the primary neurons. 
all we can almost consistently see is the glycoprotein expression is always higher in the lab adapted compared to wild type of virus. So the virus somehow they can inhibit the expression of the glycoprotein. Now that's from humans. This is a, a slide we obtained from humans infected with either by dog virus or the bat virus. Again, what you see is the anti-nuclear protein, we can see them labeled very well. But the glycoprotein is again is very, very little. So somehow the virus has a way to regulate the expression of the glycoprotein. To further confirm this question, we made another mutant. This we already talking about the G protein. We only changed the G. And then also we changed the P. We we only found is the only changing the P protein you will change the level of the G expression, as shown here, as shown here. If you change the P protein, as shown here, it does not really change. So what I have talked so far, so here what, what we can see is attenuated valves, they express more G than the pathogenic ones. This is almost invariably true for all the valves that we tested so far. I do not know why this happens, but on my own, Hypothesis is when a wild type of virus, kind of virus is just like we are, right? Uh, one of the life organisms. The, the purely purpose of a life organism is to reproduce its, themselves. In the wild, we already talked, I mentioned that earlier, for a rabies virus to transmit from one person or animal to the next, the only way it does is get the animals mad and bite the animals in th this way to transmit the virus. If the virus has no way to get out of the system, the virus will be dead. So therefore, one way they want to do is the immune system, all right? We said immune evasion. The virus has to be able to survive in the brain. One of the ways they don't want it to do is do not want the immune system to recognize the virus. So just simply say, I'm not here. Okay, the, I said that by many ways, one of the ways I mentioned here is they go to the nerve system. Another way they do it is in the nerve system, they not try to express that glycoprotein. So the immune system cannot see them. The immune system cannot see it, so the virus can, can replicate, even to transmit. So it's very important in that sense. So I think I'll try to summarize my talk here is for the wild type of virus, because it does not want to be kicked out of the body, they have to introduce, induce the virus neutralizing antibodies. That's the key of it. So therefore, they do not want the innate immunity. They do not want the system. What it does is by inhibit the expression of its own glycoprotein. It expresses some, because without the glycoprotein, there's no virus formation. So it's very dedicated balance in that system. Because they have expressed some glycoprotein in order to assemble it to new variants to passage from animals to animals. But it's too much of it, it's not good. They could induce immunity, the virus will be out. Uh, Jesse mentioned one of the few the survivors. Because in some of the survivors, the, the, the very important finding is at the time of disease, sickness, they did find a virus neutralizing antibodies in the CSF, in those patients. So therefore, a neutralizing antibody in the CSF is very important to protect, maybe eventually save the person who be infected. So on the other hand, the lab adapted virus does everything. Because the lab adapted virus, you adapted them in, in the, in the, in the non, not in, in vitro, basically. The difference in vitro, you do not have the immune surveillance anymore. Again. Any pathogen, any, any organism, the solely purpose in the biological sense is replicate itself as much as, as you can. So when the virus adapt in the cell culture system, they are away from the immune system. Of course, the only thing is start making more and more of it. Make more of, of it, they need the glycoprotein. So in the in vitro system, the virus express a lot of the glycoprotein. The virus tighter if you grew a wild type of virus and a lab adapted virus is a million fold difference. I, think I still come back to see how we use the vaccine. The vaccine is in a way sort of um, anecdotal. If we have used a wild type of virus to make a vaccine, it will not work because it does not have the glycoprotein or does not express the glycoprotein. 
So that's why we eventually, you know, is talk about the variant. So the wild type of virus, because it does not do all of this, they, be, they actually remain variant. But for the adaptive virus, because of the does this, it need, induce the immunity, it need to adaptive, it's become attenuated. So what is, the, what is the practical implication of this? I guess I have to three of them. One is to understand the pathogenic mechanisms, as I said very earlier, why the virus is so lethal, right? Number two, it could in enhance or modify, improve the kind of vaccines. The vaccines we still have to induce neutralizing antibodies, no doubt about it. The other immune effects will play a role, but without antibodies, animals will not survive. This has been demonstrated again and again. But the, what, the, what the Cheryl was talking about, the point 0.5 sort of 9 is arbitrary. It's, it's, not, it's not really, it's not dependent on the protein or not protected. It. It's very different to uh, understand on that. But you, without antibody, it would not work. Uh, the third one, the implication, is actually, we already talked about, the disease is almost always lethal. Can we actually intervene? But I think with the neutralizing antibodies, it may give a chance. But the neutralizing antibodies has, have to be in the brain to work. Even in the serum, in the system, in the periphery, will not. If the blood brain barrier is closed, the antibody cannot go into the brain. If it cannot go into the brain, it cannot neutralize the virus. Simple. Uh, so therefore, I think what I've been talking about is the three possible in practical terms. Because with that, I'm going to thank a lot of people involved in my studies for this many years. And definitely, I thank you all for your attention. I'll be glad if any questions. Working with a veterinarian who's studying about uh -huh. rabies, and uh -huh. he found out the five protein sequence of rabies is like a pinched out portion of um, snake neurotoxic yes. venom. Yes. Uh, the Thailand cobra and the banded crate snake. So I wonder if that would tie in somehow to the pathology that it produces in the brain as far as looking at it as a neurotoxin. Uh, it's a good question. Um, it was actually. Uh, it was a person from, from Fairbanks this time in Toronto talked about it. Uh, it was people start looking into that. Uh, uh, no definite answers yet for those questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, I, I was intrigued by the fact that you said that when the person gets the fight, that there is replication <coughs> within the muscle. And Presumably, that is a point at which there is the largest possibility of interacting with an innate immune system because of the vascularity, etc. And also, it takes some time to, to get into the, to the peripheral nerve because if you give the vaccine, you actually prevent that. So what is the difference at that interface within the muscle between what happens with the the attenuated form and the wild, the wild um, type form of the virus within there. People start looking at it into now. Definitely the wild type of virus, if the replicant muscle is very minimal. But the, the wild type of virus, the, the, the lab adapted, that seems to replicate even more in the muscle system, or actually in the periphery. That could give the immune system a more signal. Is that why I'm here? You know, so that, that's possibly one of the one of the one of the important aspect. But actually, nobody has done a you know detailed study to compare that. One of the problems, you know, the virus incubation period is long, because we don't even know where where the virus is, what the virus is doing during that long incubation period. So I do believe the the the, the lab adapted might be able to replicate in some of the peripheral cells. So therefore, they deliver the immune signals to the immune system. They develop a better immune response. Uh, that is said. But I think we know now, uh, the studies from CDC, or the earlier studies, there are people who have neutralizing antibodies and who have never been immunized. So must somehow, in some of the people, you know, when they've been beaten, uh, they develop immune response. Again, this, I don't know what's the percentage, but from the old says it depends on the, the, where you, the, bit, the bite is. If the bite is close to the brain, 
you get a much higher percentage of the people eventually come down with the disease. If the bite is more in the, in the ex extremities, one is because the virus takes a long time to travel, and they also give the virus more chance to be picked up by the immune system. So therefore, the peop, you know, if the bite is happening in the extremities, the, pop, the people come down with the rabies is much, much lower. So that, that, that maybe is part of the, I hope answered your question in some ways.